Hello everyone to the Fall Virtual Excel Academy with APH. We are so glad to have you with us today. We are welcoming you to getting in charge of getting around. So glad that you are with us today. You have the ability to write in the chat. Don't forget to change in your chat all panelists and attendees so we can all see. Feel free to drop in the chat who you are and where you're from. We are so glad to have you with us today. This is the APH Virtual Excel Academy for 2020 this fall. Welcome, welcome. As people are getting in, I am going to turn it over to you, Cindy, and let you take it away. I know you wanted to share your screen, so I'll give you that chance to share your screen. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am glad to see you. Oops. And it's showing on the screen. It is Looks showing. Great. It's great. This um, getting in charge of getting around, the travel topic is one of my favorite because I think it's, it's so much is focused on independence. And I'm just going to go, go ahead on my next slide. My name is Cindy Bockover, and I am the low vision consultant at the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. So I'm in Austin, Texas. We are heading to a 90 degree day, which I'm betting anybody on may not be seeing that same temperature. Uh, summer doesn't leave us easily here. Um, I have had uh, low vision uh, my entire life. I was born uh, as a ROP, retinopathy of prematurity, and I have never had a driver's license. Um, so this topic kind of, I definitely grew up with. Um, I'll say that I do have um, the choice to not drive. It is my choice where sometimes the state gets to decide for you, uh, depending on your level of vision. So what I want to talk about today is that because you are not at the wheel, then what are those skills and tools that we use that let us still be independent? Because so often when I visit with someone and I, yeah, I don't drive, I, you know, I walk or I bike or I use the bus. And so often I get that response of, oh, wow, that's too bad. That must be really hard. And I, I so often just go, mm, there are frustrations in it, just like there are frustrations for a driver, but I'm still independent. And that's what I want anyone who has a visual impairment and either chooses to or does not drive, that it's, nope, I still have my freedom. I'm still independent because I have choices of how I, that, where I want to go, getting to where I want to go. So um, I'm curious if we could find out, and I have a slide here that says poll time of what size city are you living in? What size of community are you living in? So and we can work on people navigating into the chat to check which of these words describes where you live now. If you have a problem accessing the chat, you are well, or accessing the poll, you're welcome to drop your answer in the chat. Do you live in a rural area, a suburban area, or an urban area. Then take a minute and picture yourself at 25 years old. What size of community would be your choice at 25? Rural, suburban, urban. I'll give a minute, let those answers come in. If you cannot navigate over to the chat, that is okay. You're welcome to put it or navigate to the poll, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Give it one more second because it's an interesting tie at the moment. Okay, I'm going to display the answers that we got. 
it is a tie for rural, suburban, and urban, straight across for where you live now. <laughs> But for pictured at 25, the one that wins is suburban at 50%, rural at 33, and urban at 17. And then we did have another person who dropped in the chat that it's rural for them. Okay, that, that's helpful to know. Um, as, as I was picturing the poll, and my slides are both. Um, the, the thought came to mind that around you, I'm betting most of the people, the adults you know, are drivers. That's, that's typical for where, you know, in the United States. And when you're, you don't have a driver's license or don't drive, it's just that you're doing it differently. And that's where I think that perspective is everything. Because when people, you know, show that, oh, I'm so sorry, you can't drive. From their perspective, that's what they're sharing with me, but I don't feel that same perspective. And I have a picture on the slide here of a young woman heading out the door, and the term non-driver is what I hear most often, but in a book I'm going to refer to later, Finding Wheels, they've been using the phrase now, active traveler. And I like that so much better because it says what I am doing, not what I'm not. And I, I think that's really important. So we're going to talk uh, today, when I think of 20 years ago, um, how things have changed with what types of transportation options we can choose from now. And I think it's a really, it's an exciting time to be able to, what we say, access transportation um, in different ways. So I have three particular goals for today. I want to talk about, as age appropriate, the responsibilities of being an active traveler and getting in charge of your travel needs. There, because you're not just grabbing the car keys and going, there are a a unique set of responsibilities in that. And then there's a specific skill set. Just as if you're a cook, a good cook has a skill set. So we're going to talk about some of those skills that are needed. And then um, towards the, the last half is looking at the pros and cons of each of those options. And I hope that you who are listening in, a, in the lesson today that you've been able to try a couple of different options in transportation and maybe this session presents some new ideas that would be my first goal so i have a picture on the um, screen here the title is i'm waiting for the google car and this is actually an advertisement from the 1950s so you think 70 years ago there was already the idea that we would have something like the Google car, either autonomous vehicle, self-driving vehicle, and that I'm waiting for the Google car. One of my students who attended our um, driving class said that phrase, that I don't need to be a driver, I'm waiting for the Google car, because you students who are attending, this is going to be in your lifetime. And that is just exciting. Um, and I think even people who do drive, adults who have their own car, they may be waiting for the Google car too, because driving is a very demanding task. Um, it's, it, it allows um, independence as well, but it can be demanding. So right off the top, I'm going to uh, talk about those, uh, your active traveler skills. And I need to move, there it is. Um, I refer to this, the active passenger challenge. So you're probably used to, you might run errands with mom or dad. And if you have your headphones on or maybe you're just paying attention to your phone screen, I'm going to give you the challenge to change that. 
and see if your parent will, you have to tell me, okay, we're heading to the grocery store. You have to tell me where we turn. If, even if you're following on your GPS on the phone or um, if a car is getting too close, you're paying attention and telling your parent or the family member who's ever at the wheel, hey, that car on the left is getting too close where you are being that active passenger. And I think that's too often, um, I find when I visit with my students with low vision, that they're, they're not paying attention to, to the road. Um, see if you can do practice time with an adult that um, you may have a um, comms, a certified O&M specialist that you travel with, but see if there's another adult who maybe you could ride the bus together or maybe you could call up a Lyft or an Uber, that ride app, and do it together so that you're kind of, you're practicing this. You're experimenting with different forms of transportation. And then knowing what are the costs of that, um, where you decide, if I'm gonna ask for a ride from someone, what am I swapping? What am I exchanging that somebody is helping me out by giving a ride? Then I'm washing the dishes tonight, or I get to rake the yard or babysit my brother. That it's you're setting up that exchange rate for a ride because that's the real adult world that there's a cost to rides keeping track of those costs so that you can do it so quickly in your head that you know um, it's not just the amount of gas, but in addition time and what it costs to own a vehicle. We're gonna get to that in a minute. So having a sense in your own head, um, the time and the money are cost in travel. And then what would be your dream that solo trip I want to take, even if it's just in the neighborhood or somewhere in where your community or even further away out of state, because they say every journey starts with the first step, you planning what I want that to be. And then if you have a sibling maybe who is going to be a driver, are parents helping to fund? Are they giving financial support to your sibling? And you as a non-driver, what is fair as financial support from your parents on that? Um, so each of those I think are different. Maybe you can talk with your comms about it or uh, with your parents on these topics for starting to do that, I'm getting in charge of getting around. And that first question we hear on my next slide is questions to ask, where do you want to live? What, what size of the community? And you guys have identified that at the beginning. So it's you kind of have this future goal already in mind. And so all of your planning, your developing skills goes towards that. And I'm curious, um, we know that we most often we go to school or work. Um, what are the other activities or the interests? Where do we go outside of school or work? What are the places we go to? And I've got a note here that I'm curious to hear in the chat. What are the places that you go to? We know the grocery store because generally that's where we get food. What are other places that we go? What's important to you? And I'm gonna wait a minute to see if some answers come in on that. So hi, Cindy, this is Robin. For everybody, I'm reading the chat out loud. So we already see some things coming in, uh, a coffee shop, 
maybe a local uh, Starbucks or fun place. And is it wrong if I say Target, as that's a place I end up going a lot, is uh, Target. Uh, <laughs> I find myself there. We also hear from Joy that she goes to the gym. I agree. The Local yep. stores, the gym. Let's see if anybody else has something. Robin continually at Target. That's another fun one. And we'll give just another second to see if anybody answers. I like what Leanne wrote in the chat. She said, where did you maybe go before COVID hit? Um, yep. So Jeremy talked about how he used to go to work, to work on his job skills. Um, Leanne, a friend of my own heart, says the mall, um, maybe pre-COVID. Maya's ringing in with the library. I love that. I miss my library so much. So lots of really fun community places is what everybody is sharing of where they go now or pre-COVID, maybe even restaurants. I could say maybe my favorite restaurants to get nachos or um, desserts. That was something I, I love to do. So those look like you guys some are of our- Exactly on the page. I mean. Yes, perfect. So there you go, uh, Cindy, back to you. Okay. Um, and there's always those practical things, like sometimes you just have to go to the post office, you're, you know, needing to, a package, or the bank, not all of it can be done online, those, um, the dry cleaner, so there's so many, um, there's so much of travel that, that we do just to keep life going. And when you think of then that list that you guys just helped build, what skills do we need to work on for traveling independently? And we're going to move into that in, um, in our next few slides. So an activity I do with my, my students, and oh, how I wish we were all in the same room doing this. I call it, it's in the bag. So a Saturday before COVID, it was typical for me that I would start out about 8.30, 9 o'clock, get on the bus, and I had a list of things I was doing. And I may not get home until 4 or 5. So what are some things, and when I do this with students, we come up with easily a list of about 15 things that when I'm out all day, let's say it's a... Um, possible, I'm going to give you a hint, possible rain, and it's 90 degrees in Austin, Texas, and we're heading out for the day. What are things that if you are riding in a parent's car, there are things all around you, the glove box, the seat, the console, the back seat, but you are packing in one bag what you need. I'm curious, what list of things can we think about that I'm heading out for the day? And see if you can put those in the chat. And this is Robin jumping in again. Um, as we wait for some of those answers to come through, I definitely will say, I'm going to say a pocket juice which is those little portable chargers for my phone because having my phone die is a terrible thing for so many reasons. My lists are on my phone. You might need it for accessibility, yep. your screen reader app. So I always say that sometimes they're called a pocket juice or a portable battery um, system. I always say that one. Leanne is coming in. Oh, definitely. She says her earbuds are one. Um, definitely having those earbuds are another. And that's two. I and I got a hint for a possible day. Is it wrong that I have to remind myself to bring my wallet uh, so that I have <laughs> cash or a car to pay for things? Um, there's another. All right, let's see from our attendees. What are some other things you would need in your bag? We'll give you some time to think. I'm gonna pick on our friend Jeremy, who I already know is a great participant. What thing do you think you need? We know we need money, 
We need earbuds. What else do we need? Hmm. That hint was possible rainy day. Oh. And I just took a sip of water. <laughs> We'll wait maybe 30 more seconds and I'll. Oh, there it is. We've got our friend Zachary weighing in and he says an umbrella. Yes. And that other I hint, that I saw it. I, I saw Cindy drinking that water and it reminds me how much I always make sure that I bring some kind of reusable water bottle so that I can drink. I'm going to do a little chuckle here because Zachary said, Zachary said the right thing was an umbrella, but he always forgets it. Um, and don't we always think about that? Like, oh, it was on the counter and we walk away. So preparation is another very important one. So good answers, everybody. Oh, if it's super sunny, oh, go ahead. Oh, Robin. you know what? We have Ashley who just slide, uh, slid, not slided, slid right in there. And she says, hi, I'm Ashley. She's legally blind. So she doesn't really get around outdoor, but she has her caregiver or a parent nearby whenever she's out in the community. So I like that knowing your resources. She also shares about how she gets around well in her home and in the backyard when she's doing little things. Thank you for sharing, Ashley. You're doing that. You're very mobile, it sounds like. So I'll throw in a couple more. So if it's bright and sunny, at least sunglasses, because that is the best eye protection you can have. Maybe a hat. And because I use um, my optical devices, I have my little pocket magnifier. And I have my telescope, because if I hear some loud noise or some music across the street, I want to check it out. So I'm, I'm carrying those. And say my bus, I, I do a transfer, but it's late. So I've got 20 minutes. I'm just, I don't want to just sit there and don't uh, want to play on my phone the whole time. So I might have a book. And what are some other things? Sometimes it's really cold on the bus. It can be like my friend called it a meat locker level of cold where I have some kind of a sweater or a shawl. So just from this last couple minutes, we've got easily, and I'll call them essential items, maybe even a snack, nuts, a granola bar, a piece of fruit. So this is an example of that, you know, planning ahead and preparing. So I always have a specific bag when I'm going to be out all day that I can fit these items in. And then Cindy, just so you know, I typed out your list of things that you mentioned, like sunglasses, hat, op your optical devices. I made that a list. And I put that in the chat. So in case you were like, what was that that she was saying? It's a good list. You can just copy and paste from the chat um, the list of Cindy's great tips that go in her specific bag when she's on the go. And my O&M friends would remind me to say, if you use a cane or an identity cane, that's, that's in the bag too. So thinking about tools, making sure you've got your being staying hydrated through the day um, and making sure I'm comfortable. So all of that goes into uh, comfort in your travel. And we know that when you're an active traveler, it's different than being at the wheel. So we have a responsibility in ride planning and paying. Um, say if I've hired, I'm going to pay my neighbor to do, run some errands with me. Um, I, I'm responsible for, okay, let's do this one first because that's going to start on the east 
side of town and we'll head west. And it's what route do we want to take? I have a responsibility in, in being part of that decision making. And from the choices of transportation, some are more expensive. They can be fast modes of transportation. Some don't cost much at all, and it might be more time. So it's, it's kind of a balancing act of depending what my needs are in that day and how my travel budget gets used. Flexibility is another um, that can be different when, hey, I was some, um, the coworker was gonna pick me up but has been delayed 20 minutes. Okay, how am I gonna use that wait time? And, and having those options. Knowing my preferred backup, if um, I'm gonna catch the bus to work, but it's delayed and I've got a meeting I've got to get to, what's my next backup plan? Having that kind of um, answer, just quick in your head, you know what it's backup is. And the, uh, Dr. Penny Rosenblum is, and um, Dr. Sharon Sachs did a study where they talked with adolescents and they looked at the perceptions of driving and non-driving. And those adolescents, um, young teenagers, were really willing to talk about the frustrations that go with this because no system is perfect. Drivers have frustrations and active travelers have frustrations too. And the top response that they said that explaining to others why I can't drive, because we are a very small percent of the population. So it's that um, frequently it's having to explain that. And that's your choice of how much you talk about that. That not being able to get where I want to go, not being able to be spontaneous. And that's part of the reality that because I, I'm not grabbing the car keys and jumping in the car and going, but it's planning ahead, making sure I've, I'm keeping my travel budget funded so that I can get to where I want to go. Depending on family for rides, having to use public transportation, these are from the, the top responses that this group of adolescents Gave. And these last two, I'm going to make a comment on. They say not dating because I don't have transportation or difficulty in finding a job. And both of those, I think this study was done 16 years ago. Things are a little different now where we have more options. And I think um, definitely as an active traveler, you can date. Um, there are ways to get transportation and that there are ways to get to a job. So I uh, wanted to point those out as that's those are part of the reality, but it's our planning ahead and knowing our resources that we can um, make this improve our situation on this. So well, I've mentioned already the cost of being a driver. When you think about the cost of the vehicle itself, um, it is clearly it's very important um, item because so many people are drivers and they own a vehicle. But those additional costs, like the things that every month, um, gas, uh, you pay for the pay, uh, car insurance, um, things like taxes or the paying for your tag on the car, possibly tolls and parking, all of these. And a um, friend shared with me from the website, they took what is the average that people pay a month to own and operate a vehicle. And we've got, um, Leanne's gonna, there's a poll that I wanna find out what do you think? It's more than $100 a month. Okay, so here are your choices. The average monthly cost of having a car is $500 to $599, $600 to $699, $700 to 
$700 to $799. $800 to $899. Or $900 to $999. What is the average monthly cost of having a car? So is it a 500 number, a 600 number, a 700 number, an 800 number, or a 900 number. And if you can't access the poll, you are welcome to type it in the chat. That is okay. What do you think is the average monthly cost of having in the car? So out of all the different car payments there are, if we rolled them all and then divided by that number, what is our average? Because everybody has some different ones. We do have a hand raised when I end this poll. So hang on, Isabel. Okay, I'm going to end this poll. Don't, don't say anything yet, Cindy. Let's see if Isabel wants to give her guess. At the moment, 60% said it's in the $600 range. And then 20% in the $500 range and 20% in the $800 range. But let's ask Isabel. Isabel, you are able to talk. Try holding down the space bar or clicking Alt A. 900. Ooh, 900. Hmm, <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say ding, ding, ding. Isabel wins. <gasps> now, yeah, I had a room full of adult drivers. There were 35 in the room. This was our driving workshop that we do each year at TSBVI, and I asked them this same question. And that group of 35 adults, same thing as what the national average says, where we know it's an average, so somebody may that, you know, oh, I pay 762 when I average it out a month. But the national average and that room full of people I asked said 900. It is, it is a um, significant dollar figure. And I recognize that people who, that's for my convenience, my comfort, my spontaneity, that's the price tag that's on it. So I do this to illustrate, if we're catching a ride from somebody, we need to be supporting that driver and those costs. Thank you guys for weighing in on that. And we did that. Oops, I should have switched for that. So I want to talk now about travel skills. And I'm betting you guys are going to have some um, ideas on this as well. So just some examples. Using your, the G, your GPS on your phone, I think what most of us pull up. Other kinds of apps like I have one called Transit that I can pull it up and it tells me where the closest bus stop is, if there's a Lyft or an Uber nearby. Um, so finding different travel apps. And I'll bet if you have, uh, you're working with an, a comms that they might have some suggestions as well. I think we don't see them as often, but paper maps being, if you can access that paper map, or you're doing it through the, uh, your phone, having a sense of north, south, east, west, or the length of a block. If it says you have 450 uh, feet to go to your destination, what does that mean? What does it take me five minutes or one minute to walk that far? So being able to use the things like compass or um, accessing the timetable on a bus or a train schedule. I've already mentioned using optical devices. I'd include in that, those are tools, using your cane. Having a skill of getting accurate travel directions. Because if I call a business that's new to me and ask them things like, um, what's the cross street? I know your address, but what's the cross street? Or what color? is your building? Do you have a big sign that gives me clues for how I'm going to um, catch that I am close to this 
building, this business that I want to get to. Building communication skills, because when you're either hiring somebody to be a driver or say I'm uh, traveling on the bus, that I know how to be courteous and I know maybe to not be over friendly with people. So it's working on those appropriate communication skills. Practicing problem solving. We did an example of that with what's in your travel bag. So planning ahead, thinking through, and then choosing the appropriate times to maybe either to talk about your visual impairment or being uh, self-advocating for your needs, asking a bus driver or a hired driver um, for specific assistance. So those are examples of travel skills. And I will, uh, another time for the chat, if it's a, you have a travel skill that I didn't get on my list, I'd, be, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. And here comes Robin again to look over. I know that this question sometimes stumps a lot of students. I have found that some of this stumps um, a lot of my students and as we wait for things to come through, one thing that my college students are doing is we are learning to call the city planner and get information about the area that we're going to. So that has been helpful. Um, Zachary's being honest and saying that he usually asks his mom and he admits that he has to work on this. But you know what, Zachary, I'm going to say your parents can be good resources. Maybe they can see something that you don't. So you keep working on it, but I say it's okay to keep asking your mom uh, every once in a while if you need, if you need any help. And if you're catching a ride from her, Zachary, picture yourself at 26. How are you going to pay for those rides? Mm -hmm. And it's not just money payment. We'll get to that in a minute. Well, Cindy, I, another, think, we, I, I think we stumped. So give, yes, give another idea because I think we've stumped a few of us with thinking about this one. I'm gonna think of it as a skill of having muscles that let me carry my groceries, whether I'm walking or I put them in my backpack on the bike So I'll go ahead and go to the next slide and maybe some thoughts will come in later on that. So I'm really happy to say that the, the newest edition, Finding Wheels, is a super, uh, I'm going to say student and teacher friendly book with ideas and activities for building those independent travel skills. And it, is finally about to be published. They just announced this month that it's going to be out very soon. So I've got a picture of the cover here and Drs. Uh, Ann Corn and Dr. Penny Rosenblum um, have worked very hard on finally getting that out. So I'm going to move now to the final topic in our uh, session today and looking at different transportation options. And I have, what, six listed here? There, there may be others, but we're, I'm really quickly going to go through some pros and cons of what um, are like routine modes of transportation. So walking and biking is one way to get around. Requesting rides from friend, family or friends. My third option listed here is hired drivers and setting up a contract if it's the same person. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Taxis, um, that's especially smaller communities can have taxis as, as well as big cities do. Ride share such as Lyft and Uber and that now that ride shares are on the scene, I think we have fewer taxi companies but they are still out there. And then mass transit. 
such as bus, train, or subway. Train or subway are pretty much for much larger urban communities, but it's moving a, a large group of people through a city. And I've got this, so what's your plan A and plan B? And if we're talking about walking and cycling, um, I really, those are my first choice because it's totally up to me. I get to say when I go. And in Austin, because we still have heavy traffic, on my bike, I can sometimes move faster than the traffic. So I like that it's totally up to me on that. And it's a really, I stay healthy by doing that. Um, the, when it's not great weather, if it's super hot or maybe wet or cold, um, the weather can affect that is a kind of a negative on this. Um, and um, being sure that I'm safe in traffic because I have to be, of course I'm wearing a helmet, but I have to pay extra attention that I'm aware of where the cars are. Um, and, and being safe um, if I'm walking, knowing that I'm doing it during daylight hours. So with these, if, if there's always a trade-off on something, what I like about it, but what I also need to be aware of, um, caution and paying attention. So catching rides from family or friends. Um, it's somebody you know that, um, you know, you're really familiar with them and there's definitely a comfort level in that. They have their space either in the trunk or the back seat where you can pick, you know, um, all the things you're picking up along the way doing errands along the way that they can um, help with that. Where if I'm on my bike, it's limited how much I can pick up. Or I'm on the bus, there's only so many bags um, I can carry on the bus. Sometimes, um, and this, I learned this the hard way. Um, I had asked a friend too many times for a ride and I heard her use the word burden. What a, you know, she's a burden. And that really got my attention. And that's when I swore to myself, I will not let that happen again. I need to, the fancy word is reciprocate. If I ask for a ride, then I need to be sure I'm doing a form of payment. Um, it's generally quick. Um, let's see. Yeah, that, I think covered that one. So thinking about types of reciprocation, because um, we do this with parents all the time, kind of trade negotiations. Uh, if, if you, you know, uh, get a ride to the mall, how much I'm going to swap out for doing some cleaning the bathroom, say. So um, you can set up working for rides. I always use the example when, when I talk with my students because they're generally better at technology than I am. If you've got an older neighbor who needs help with some technology and they're able to drive you somewhere, that's an example of swapping a skill that you have for getting a ride or even that pay as you go. Like I'll fill the gas tank or I'll get lunch for us along the way. How about, do you have some ideas? What are skills or what would you swap for getting a ride from someone? And we'll take a minute just to see if some ideas come in the chat. All right, here is your friendly voice to read out uh, from our chat window as everybody is thinking. And maybe you don't have ideas, but maybe you've done one of the really cool ideas that Cindy was talking about. Have you ever um, worked for a ride or negotiated? Um, so share your ideas or tell us if you've done one of these cool um, skills that you could do. So Zachary said that he wants to trade for it with his brother when driving. So again, doing a trade. 
I also um, have seen some students say, you know, I don't need you to go into the store with me, but if you could drop me off and then pick me up something, then they pick up a few items for the person who's dropping them off. And then they just wait and kind of get a pick up that way. So you could say, hey, do you need dinner as well? I can pick you up a few of these items if you could drop me off at that store. So that's another one. Great example. Does, does anybody think that these ideas um, could work? Which ones do you think are the ones that you could do the most? All right, think of what are some other ones that could definitely work. I have a picture on this slide of a, a young lady filling the gas tank. And even if you're not the driver, sometimes drivers, they just get tired of having to fill, you know, pump the gas, so to speak. Um, washing the windshield, um, which is always available at the gas station. Oh, I always say, especially when it gets cold outside, getting out of my car is like the last thing I want to do. So if somebody else is willing to do that, that's definitely something. And one other thing while everybody's thinking about this, because I know many of you are going to watch this on the recording, that reciprocation also starts with gratitude and expressing the expressing your gratitude. And then that just opens you up. These are great ideas. Put it out there. You could even say, hey, what, what, would, what would work for you? So really cool tips. Cindy, we don't see a lot of other ones coming through, but I think you've given everybody some really nice um, strategies of ways that we can reciprocate. So I'm gonna throw it back to you. It's that challenge of, okay, keep thinking about it. Because we, you have skills, I don't have that um, people will appreciate what you can bring. So with a hired driver, I think this is another really great exercise. A couple of times I have been able to hire a driver where I think that contract is really important to have because I am paying for a service and that person then we need to agree on kind of the terms of that person being a driver. And there typically this can, it has an expense factor, but it's also, um, it's kind of up to you. You get to direct how many rides a week or which of the rides am I hiring somebody for. And these factors I listed out in writing a driver's contract. And depending on the person, um, I think finding that hiring that person where so many people are working from home now that they may have more flexibility in offering rides. A, um, a parent who maybe one parent works and the other parent stays at home um, is another. A couple of my drivers I found through, um, what is it, retired, retired truck drivers. Um, Trying to remember the name of the, the company he had worked for, leaving my brain. But um, asking around at church, um, maybe within your own uh, social media group, um, finding that person who's willing to be a driver, agreeing on the hours available for driving. Some people don't mind. Hey, if I went to a friend's house and it's 930 at night and I want to catch a ride home, nope. I don't drive after nine o'clock. So you have to agree, what are the available hours for driving? How much time do I need to give to cancel a trip? Because if that person is depending on your payment, um, we need to agree on what's the one day in advance or otherwise I get to pay if I don't meet that. Um, the condition of the vehicle, making sure it's safe and clean enough. Um, choosing the route and providing directions that shouldn't necessarily be on the person driving. Um, it's mine as that active traveler as well. Um, and there are some additional considerations. Say, is the person, I needed to pick up a screen door 
at one point. So it was figuring out who in my uh, driver group could help with that. So those are just some examples of what to think about on the contract. On this next slide, I've got, hey, taxi. And uh, often taxis, some actually are 24 seven. There are, you know, there's always an available driver. That's not true for all taxi companies, but that can be a choice. When I was um, relying on taxis more, if I find a favorite driver, often I could get that person, they would provide their own cell number. It's still going through the taxi company, but I could request that particular driver um, because they were able to provide the cell number. Sometimes they, they have uh, vouchers. If you have a disability, that can be a plus. Um, I had found that it can be considerable wait time with taxis. Um, and that got to be a real problem for me where I ended up not using them as much. There's definitely a price tag on them because there's a base fee and then the fare of the trip itself. Um, making sure that I feel that the driver is being safe um, there were sometimes concerns on that. So pros and cons on each. This, the ride shares such as Uber or Lyft, um, I'll admit my own personal ex experience on this. Um, I was very nervous at the beginning. And I, uh, when I was visiting my nephew in Chicago, I did it together with him. I saw how it worked. You put an app, download an app on your phone, your credit card information is there, so no money exchanges hands. And then I started doing it on my own after that weekend of trying it with my nephew. I always ask the driver's name. I don't get in the vehicle. I open the door and ask the name because I don't always, may not be able to walk around and read the license plate because the app lets you know the driver's name and the type of car. Um, and testing this out with a parent, um, I think, can, is a really good thing to try. Um, I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to uh, move quickly through these last ones. Taking the bus, I, I miss my community of people that I always saw on the bus. Um, sometimes it does get delayed. It makes stops along the way and can be feel slow but I've just learned to make use of that wait time. I'm not driving, so I get to read. I love that. And I think my biggest, um, the pluses I see in, in being an active traveler, it's good for me, I'm healthier. It's good for our planet. I'm not putting another vehicle out there on the road. And I feel really connected to my community because I am mixing with them either on the bus or when I'm walking on the sidewalk through my neighborhood. And to me, those are the three big reasons why this active traveler, it has its good side. This last mode of transportation, um, commercial bus lines, things like Greyhound or Megabus, that's where I did my first out of state trips. Um, I've got a big window on the world and generally they're very affordable. Um, that last poll, I think we're gonna have time. So I am curious, what of the options we've talked about? Okay, so which transportation uh, option? I'll let you introduce it, Lee. There you go, yeah, you're cutting a little out. Um, what transportation option do you most wanna learn about? So here are your choices. Walking or riding a bike is one choice. A ride from a family or friend. A hired driver. A taxi. A ride share app such as Lyft or Uber. Public transportation, bus, subway, train. Or a commercial bus such as a mega bus or the Greyhound. Give it a minute. What transportation option do you most 
want to learn about. And if you can't access the poll, you can just drop it in the chat. That is just fine. One more minute. Which transportation do you most want to learn about? Well, it looks like you have a three-way tie between walking, the ride share, and the commercial bus. Commercial bus. That's, I'm glad to hear your answers on that. Um, so I've got on my last slide of kind of summing it all up. Um, you think setting your own goals thinking about, okay, how do I want to attack this? How do I want to start getting in charge of getting around? Building your travel skills. What is it that I freely admit? I have never been good at reading maps. I, it's just, I didn't do it as a child and I still have that. So that's a travel skill I can get better at. Um, and then building familiarity with those travel options. It's um, all of them are possible in any size community. Not, not all of them are possible in any size community, but we all have choices within a community. I have, the, um, I have lived a number of different places from a town of 217 people that literally was two hours from almost anywhere. It was very rural. To a city of over a million, which is where I live now. And even in that tiny rural town, I could walk and bike. I could hire a driver. I could arrange with a friend, kind of set up a swamp up to where I am now that I literally have multiple options with having ride and, or excuse me, Uber and Lyft available, the bus, still doing biking and walking. So knowing your options on this is really important. And then I think recognizing, acknowledging those responsibilities that as an active traveler, I have a part in this. So we've got um, my email is there on the slide as well. And I am really interested if anybody has more questions or wants to contact for further information or just share your other thoughts. Um, again, I started out with, I, this is kind of a favorite topic for me because I think it's not well understood that as an active traveler, there are pluses. It's, it's a, there's a positive way to see this. So if there are maybe questions at the end or other comments that anybody has, we have just a minute or two. I'll let those come in, but while we're waiting for those, I want to say thank you, Cindy. It is great to hear how you can be an active traveler, even if you are not behind a driver's wheel of a car or a truck. That is a really great way to think about uh, being a traveler. I really liked that, that was good. And I'm not seeing any, so I'm going to say thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Tomorrow is a session kind of built for students with um, more challenging needs. I'm really looking forward to it. We are going to be talking about a pumpkin book, if I have that right, Robin. So I'm looking forward to this story to hear. And next week, we'll have three days again on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesday, we aim toward our kind of anywhere between kindergarten and sixth grade. And on Wednesday, we're aiming for our older students, seventh grade and up. And then on Thursday, again, our students who have multiple disabilities. But you are welcome to attend any and all sessions. We love having you. Have a great afternoon, and I'm going to say goodbye, all. Thank goodbye. you. Bye.